I invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. I'm just going to read a couple of verses in John chapter 6 to kind of talk about the whole thing. But starting in verse 16 of John chapter 6, we read, When evening came, his disciples went to the, down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then, then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. Now there's uh, several familiar stories in John chapter 6. If you read the whole chapter, you'll recognize all these stories. The first part of the chapter is the story of the famous feeding of the 5,000. Jesus had crossed the Sea of Galilee, and this huge crowd followed him. And John tells us that when they saw all the miraculous signs that he was doing, that they, they, they followed him. Probably followed him because hoping to see more. I mean, what do you, what do you expect when somebody's showing miraculous signs? What do you want to see? Let's, let's follow this guy and see what he's going to do next. This is, this is looking exciting. When he saw the crowd... He asked the disciples, where are they going to get bread for these people to eat? He said, hey guys, we've got to feed these people. And as usual, Jesus already had a plan. And, and this was a rhetorical question. He was just kind of asking to see what they would do. He wanted to see how they'd react. And Philip answered in a very practical way. You've always, you always have your, pra your, your pragmatic people in the crowd. He's like, Jesus, eight months' wages wouldn't buy enough food for all these people to take a bike, let alone have a solid meal. Like, what do you, what do you want from us? I mean, we can't work eight months in the next five minutes and earn enough money to buy. And, and not, not only that, there's not really a deli right around the corner. We can just go get cake out of all you can eat buffet. And, and there's, there's some limitations as to where we are and what we've got. We don't have enough food. And another disciple was Andrew, who, who uh, Peter's brother, who Andrew's still practical, but he's looking for a better answer. And he finds this little boy who's got five small barley loaves and two fish. But instantly he comes down to earth and he realizes that's not even close to being enough food for all these people. I mean, me and a couple of buddies can take care of five loaves and two fish. Yeah, that's, that's a couple of fish sandwiches and a couple of extra bread with some butter on it. That's, a, that's not going to get her done for 5,000 people. Well, that's when something special happens. Something miraculous happens. This, this is one of the reasons you follow Jesus. He tells the disciples, hey, have, them, have them all set up. And there's plenty of room in the field and 5,000 men sat down. And I have no, I'm no, for as good as I am at mental pictures, I'm no good with numbers and people. I don't know how, many, how much room it would take for 5,000 people to sit down. But I dare say we could put 5,000 people sitting down in the yard, in the yard around the church, you think? 5,000 people? Um, I think so. Um, pretty sure you go to a baseball game over in Altoona, they get 5,000 people in that park. That's what 5,000 people looks like. They all sat down. And I, I've been to a lot of dinners at church. And sometimes we know we have enough food. There's no real cause for concern. Other times, you look at the crowd coming, you're like, I don't know if we have enough food. Oh, boy, I hope we have enough food. It's like, okay, I, I don't need to eat. So gonna, so, and so you start to kind of do the math. It's like, look, there's enough food. You start cutting the pieces smaller. And it, it really depends on how many people come and how hungry they are. But in this case, there's no way they have enough food. <coughs> this church dinner is going to go south in a hurry because there's not going to be enough food. By the time people are like, all right, come back here to eat ever again. Right? But in this case, it's just, there's just no chance. It doesn't matter how, you know, it's, and, uh, I'd be worried sick. Because we're going to let all these people down. It doesn't matter how tasty it is, there's not enough. And it's not going to be close. But then Jesus takes the loaves. When Jesus takes the loaves, it, it, it happens. He gives thanks and he starts to distribute the loaves to all those who are sitting there. And I would have... Would you have loved to have gotten this on video to see what it looked like as Jesus take the loaves and he's dealing them out? He took five loaves of barley and 5,000 guys ate as much as they wanted. And John tells us he did the same thing with the fish. And again, 5,000 guys split two fish and they had as much as they wanted. Something clearly happened that day that doesn't usually happen when you sit down to eat. Something amazing happened that day. Something powerful happened that day. Only through the power of God can 5,000 guys eat and get enough to eat with the supplies they had that day. And not only did they get enough to eat, but when they gathered all the leftovers, 
They filled 12 baskets with the pieces and five of the five oil loaves and all that they ate. There was more left than they started with. See, that, that's amazing. That's the power of God. And rather than try to scratch our heads and figure out how Jesus did that, he did that through the power of God. It's, it's a miracle. John tells us that after people saw what Jesus did that day, they began to say, surely this is the prophet that's come into the world. This is, <laughs> this is something special about this guy. And they were starting to get it, which is a good thing. But Jesus saw something here they didn't like. Something that probably only Jesus could have seen. He seems to know that they had in mind to make him king by force, it says. So he withdrew to a mountain by himself. This has to be Jesus discerning their hearts. Because there's no real indication of anything we read there about, about them doing anything forceful. But in any event, Jesus gets away. He goes up on a mountain. And by the time we get to the end of chapter 6, Jesus has finished this long teaching about himself being the true bread from heaven. And he, and he really kind of takes everything upon himself. Like, there's, there's enough of me to go around and there'll be plenty left. You, you're not going to run out of me. We're not going to wake up and say, hey, okay, Jesus, I, I'm good. I got enough. Take a day off, man. That's just not going to happen that way. He connects the Israelites wandering in the, wandering in the desert. Remember, they're wandering in the desert and surviving on what? Manna from heaven. With what happened in the previous day with the loaves and fishes, he connects those dots. It, it wasn't Moses who gave them the bread from heaven. It was Jesus' Father who gives them the true bread from heaven. That true bread from heaven is Jesus. And they said to him, Sir, give us some of this bread now. We like, we like what we're hearing and we want more. That's good stuff. Jesus says in John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He said, and that's the good news. That's also the power of God. And tucked right in the middle, very neatly in the middle, between these two stories about the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus being the bread from heaven is this short snippet of a story of Jesus walking on the water. It's the same day he fed the 5,000. It's evening. And he and his disciples went down to the lake. And verse 17 tells us they got on a boat and they set off across for Capernaum. Not, not, not very far, just across the corner of the lake. And it's dark at this point, and Jesus hadn't joined them. He's still on the mountain. In the meantime, a strong wind comes up and begins to blow, and the waters get really rough. And I can see how it would be fun to be out on a boat. I, I would tell you I enjoy being out on boats. I think I've never been out on a boat twice in my life. But it was fun both times. And so, uh, so I can't really say that it's fun, but it was fun both times. It's fun to be out on a boat. But I can see it being just as scary when a storm blows up and the waters get rough. It's one thing when you're, when you're, whenever you're sitting in your living room and a storm gets to blowing. <clears throat> it's another thing when you're actually out on a boat and the storm's blowing and that thing could, you just never know when that thing could uh, capsize and blow over and, and you're in a world of hurt. But anyhow, the storm and the waters get rough. And John, who's probably there since he was one of the disciples, it, it, we can assume that he was there in the boat, says that when he had rowed three or three and a half miles, that may not be real far when you're driving, but it is far when you're rowing and there's a storm. It's far when you're on the water. It's also far when you're running. So, so they saw Jesus approaching the boat. And that doesn't make sense. You know, see, they, they, they travel together. So the disciples were most likely asking themselves about how or when they would rendezvous with Jesus. When they were, they, they, it would have it made sense for them to leave without Jesus, but Jesus wasn't there, so they left. When are they going to get back together? Because it would have made more sense for them just to wait for Jesus to get on the boat in the first place. But never he went up on that mountain by himself. And he hadn't come down yet. And they decided they should cross the lake and not wait for him. Now how, how they made that decision, why they made that decision, the, maybe they had a committee meeting and decided, hey, let's cross. Who knows? But we're, told, we're not told what their thought process was behind that. We're only told what happened. So just as the wind starts blowing and the water's getting rough, Jesus shows up. And get this. He's walking on the water. That's, you heard that, right? Walking on the water. John tells us the disciples were terrified. Imagine that. Try to imagine that. It's dark, it's night, there's a storm, and you see some guy walking on the water, and it looks like Jesus. Now, that shouldn't be terrifying, because Jesus would be the exact one you'd want to see in that moment. You know, uh, but they see Jesus. And they're in the middle of a lake. And there's a storm brewing, and they see their fearless leader coming to them walking on the water. You ever, you ever a little kid, 
and you're in a swimming pool, and you're running, you try to walk on the water, you try to run across the water, you don't get real far. That first step off the deck, oof, you're in the water. I've tried walking on water. I can't do it. I, I can't, I can't, it just can't be done. But Jesus is walking on the water, and they're terrified. He says that, hey, it's I. Don't be afraid. That, thank God God showed up. You know? Verse 21 tells us they were willing, when they were willing to take him into the boat, the boat immediately reached the shore where they were headed. And you'll notice, and this is, this is big, the storm, the storm didn't stop. We're not told that the storm stopped when they took Jesus on the boat. It's just that they were something where they needed to be. That's the power of God. And I mentioned uh, one of the, another Sunday, a different Sunday, about knowing the power of God. How many times did Jesus say that you were an heir because you don't know the scriptures of the power of God? And I think I speak for all of us when I say that we want to see the power of God. We want to see the power of God. We'd have been, oh, and how awesome would have been to see Jesus walking on the water. And this story illustrates the power perfectly. This short little story is right in between two big stories about bread. What does walking on the water have to do with bread? Well, it might not. That's okay. But in the Jewish mindset, water represented the realm of evil. The deep represented the realm of evil. It represented darkness. Because if you go down deep enough, guess what? It gets dark. It gets real dark, real fast. You don't have to be real deep in the water for it to get dark. When Jesus cast a demon out of the herd of pigs, where did the herd of pigs go? Into the water. Why? There's no place like home. Right? They died, but they went into the water. During the storm, the water was a very scary place. The book of Revelation talks about the beast coming out of the sea. The Jewish people understood the sea and the deep to be the realm of evil. Now, it, it, whether it is or not is the point. That's how they understood it. So when Jesus comes to them and he's walking on the water, he's not just performing a miraculous feat by balancing his feet on the water molecules. He's demonstrating authority over evil. He's proclaiming to the realm of evil that it is just like everything else under his feet. He's got, he's tread all the powers of darkness down. And how's that song go? Wind the well fought. Hey, that's a bold proclamation to the powers of evil. They're under the feet of Jesus. And that scared them a little bit. They're like, who is this guy? He's, he's the bread from heaven. He's, he just fed 5,000 people with a little bit of bread. And now he's, he's, he's showing victory over evil. And I mentioned earlier that the storm didn't stop when Jesus got into the boat. Or when Jesus came into the boat. The storms of life don't stop whenever you invite Jesus into your boat. Evil doesn't quit when you invite Jesus into your boat. What happens when you invite Jesus in is exactly what happened to the disciples that day. All of a sudden, you're exactly where you need to be. You're safe in the arms of Jesus. That shelter in a, in a time of storm. There's a lot of songs we can sing that, that go along with that, isn't there? When you have Jesus in your life, in your boat, you're able to proclaim to the storms, to the realm of evil, that I'm with Jesus. And you can't, you can't. That doesn't mean they're not going to try to scare you. The storms of life, the storms of life will try, will try to get you, but they don't define you, do they? Because Jesus defines us. He's called us by name. We are His. That's the power of God to save. You see, salvation isn't just about going to heaven when you die. Jesus wants to save us from the storm. Jesus is still walking on the water. He's still treading on the realm of evil. And we're walking with Him. And Jesus is still to this day saying, hey, it's I. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I, I'm not sure what you're afraid of today. If you're afraid of anything today. Or, or, what, or what, what you're facing that may have you frightened. Or what, what, what storms are raging in your world. There might be, maybe, maybe you're not really in a stormy pattern right now. Maybe you are. Maybe you've got more storms than you can handle. But trust me. Jesus knows them. And he's coming to your boat. He's walking on the water. Just ask him to come on board. And by the power of God, you'll be exactly where you need to be. Because that's from Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for, for how you came to the disciples that day on the water. Lord, you come to us in the water. Lord, give us the eyes to see you. Lord, the grace to receive you. And, and Lord, you uh, come on to our boat. Come on to our boat, Lord, in the midst of the storm. And uh, Lord, take us to where you need us to be. Fill us with your spirit. We thank you for your victory over everything. We stand with you, the author and perfecter of our faith, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, you are our all in all. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.